Our talk tonight is from Andrew Mann, who is one of our graduate scholarship winners. Um, he is pursuing his PhD in plant pathology at the University of Minnesota under the direction of Dr. Robert Blanchett, who is one of our members as well, and Dr. Catherine Bushley um, from USDA ARS. I'm not sure what that is. He's originally from Austin, Texas, and received a Bachelor of Science in Forestry from Northern Arizona University and a Master of Science from Colorado State University. So the title of his presentation is The Role of Symbiotic Fungi in Tree-Killing Beetles. So this would be one that many of us will be very interested in, of course. So take it away. All right, thank you. <clears throat> With climate change and trade and travel, we've seen a lot of inv invasive species as well as native beetles that have caused a lot of damage in trees. <clears throat> and this is a problem, of course, because like humans, these beetles make their homes in trees and humans and beetles are really after the same thing. They're after wood. Um, and so we consider these beetles to be a pest. Um, but another similarity with these beetles is that they also love fungi. And so here are some lime morel photos from last weekend. Um, none of the beetles that I study are associated with morels, but um, the rest of this presentation will be about the fungi that the, the beetles that I study um, have associations with that may aid them in killing the trees. And so my talk today, I'm going to talk about three different beetles. Uh, the first one is the spruce beetle. On the top, it's this Dendroctinus rupipennis. And this is a really big um, pest in the Western US. And so this is the beetle that I studied with my master's in Colorado. And it's causing a lot of damage in the spruce forests in Colorado and Wyoming and Montana, all the way up through Alaska. And then the red turpentine beetle and the emerald ash borer are what I'm studying um, with my PhD. And so the red turpentine beetle is native to North America. We have it here in Minnesota, but it doesn't really cause a lot of damage. However, in Asia, where it's invasive, it's killing millions of trees, uh, the pine trees. And the emerald ash borer, which I assume a lot of you are very familiar with, is native to Asia, but invasive here in North America and killing a lot of our ash trees in the US and Canada. So I'm gonna start out talking about the fungi associated with the spruce beetle. And this beetle is in the, the scientific name is Dendroctinus rufipennis and Dendroctinus means tree killer. And so a lot of these Dendroctinus beetles are pretty aggressive. Beetles <clears throat> kill a lot of conifer trees, and then rufipennis means red-winged. So this is the red-winged tree killer. And like I mentioned, this beetle is just killing a lot of spruce trees throughout the Rocky Mountain region, and it just wipes out landscape-level destruction. So acres and acres, millions of acres of trees, really, of these spruce trees are just left as standing dead trees which can be a problem for a lot of reasons. Um, and one of which is ski areas. So these are really high elevation forests in Colorado. And this is something that a lot of people in Colorado are concerned about is we don't want people skiing next to all of these standing dead trees that could be pretty dangerous. So <clears throat> just a bit about the life cycle of this beetle. So sometime in the early summer, so in a couple of weeks, um, the adult beetles will emerge from the trees and they'll search for a new host. And when they find a tree that's a suitable tree, the tree fights back. And so it produces this resin or like the sap to try to physically push out the beetles, but it also produces um, a lot of chemicals that is, so it tries to chemically and physically um, keep the beetles out of the tree. However, what we've been seeing in the past 20 years is that these beetles have been pretty successful in colonizing the trees and they create these galleries in the wood of the trees, which is where they lay their eggs and the larvae feed. And the beetles leave behind this blue stain fungus you can see here on, this is like the inner part of the tree. And 
Um, you can see these on a lot of the logs and tree stumps, for example, too. And so this blue standing fungus is what I was really interested in for part of my master's. And with the spruce beetle, it's this gross mania abutina. And all of these blue staining fungi are in this order, which is a really important order for insect associated fungi, the Ophiosomateles. And we have the gross mania here. This, as, I sure, as I'm sure many of you are familiar with, fungi change their names a lot, or people change the names of fungi a lot. And so uh, just a few weeks ago, there was a major revision to this order. And so the old name is Leptographium abiotinum, and the new name is Grossmania abiotinum. So <clears throat> this order also has some other fungi that are pathogens of trees and are pretty important that are also associated with insects. So um, this laurel wilt is a really big problem in the southeastern U.S., and it's threatening all of the trees in the Lauraceae family, which includes things like avocados, um, what we get our bay leaves from, so like when you're making soup, the bay leaves are from laurel trees. And so this is a fungus, Herringtonia lauricula, that's spread by ambrosia beetles, and it's causing a lot of damage in the southeastern U.S., and we're concerned that it's going to get down into Mexico and Central America and cause a lot more damage. Um, and then another one that we're pretty familiar with here in Minnesota is Dutch elm disease, so the Ophiostoma nova ulmi and Ophiostoma ulmi. And so all of these um, fungi are really closely related to these um, Ophiostomatoids that I'm interested in with these bark beetle fungi. Um, <clears throat> and so gross mania, abutina, isn't really a pathogen of the trees, but whenever you find these spruce beetles, you always find this fungus. And we were really curious why that is. Like, why is this beetle carrying this fungus from tree to tree? We know that the um, gross mania will benefit because it is being dispersed by the beetles, but is there any benefit for the beetles um, that the fungus provides? And so we have three different hypotheses. The first one is the improved nutrition hypothesis. So maybe this fungus is providing some sort of nutrition, um, nutrients to the beetle that the beetle wouldn't normally get um, just by eating the wood of the tree. The next one is the reduction of toxic compounds hypothesis. So I mentioned that there were all these chemicals that the tree produces to try to fend off the beetles. Um, and maybe the beetles are able to degrade some of the compounds of these trees with the fungus. So maybe the fungus will aid the beetles in colonizing the trees. Um, and then the third one is this defensive hypothesis. And so maybe this gross mania fungus inhibits um, pathogens of the beetles. So we know that the trees have pathogens. These beetles also um, have pathogens as well. And many of them are fungal pathogens. So maybe this gross mania is able to um, make sure that the beetles aren't becoming infected with these pathogens. And the first, so talking about the first hypothesis, <clears throat> what we did for this was we measured the nutrient um, composition of pine phloem as well as the gross mania fungus. And what we found was that the pine phloem is basically just like candy, right? It's a lot of sugar but there's not a lot of protein, nitrogen, phosphorus that are really important for beetle development. However, the gross mania um, has those nutrients in it. So you can see here, it's pretty high in protein, nitrogen, it's really high in phosphorus for whatever reason, and then also has some fat and sugars. And so what we think is that while these beetles aren't explicitly feeding on the fungi, that just by um, feeding on the phloem, so in the wood of the trees, that they're just, they're gaining some nutrients from the fungi that wouldn't normally be there. And we can compare this to what we would see and what we would consider to be pretty nutritious fungi. So Agaricus bisporus, so this is like the button mushroom, and then desert truffles are on par with the gross mania. So this is a pretty nutritious fungus. And we can put a check mark next to the improved nutrition hypothesis. 
And then moving on to the second one, so the reduction of toxic compounds hypothesis. And this slide is a lot, but um, what we did was we introduced um, this fungus to the chemicals, as well as for a control, we just introduced water to the chemicals. And we checked the um, amounts of the tree defensive chemicals at one day, at six days, 10 days, and then 17 days. And what we found is that at every single time that we measured the um, media that we had exposed um, the fungus to that had the chemicals in it had um, significantly lower amounts <clears throat> of the toxic compounds. And so we can conclude that um, that this fungus is able to degrade these chemicals that are produced by the tree and the beetle likely benefits from that. And so we'll put a check marks next to the second hypothesis. And then the third hypothesis, the defensive hypothesis, for this one, we studied an entomopathogenic fungus and we didn't look at the Orphea cordyceps here, but I think this is a really cool video of the zombie ant fungus. And so what this Orphea cordyceps does is it infects an ant and then the ant changes its behavior where it climbs to the tops of the trees and the fungus grows out of its head and then it will spread its spores. So the fungus can affect more ants. Um, we studied Bovary bassiana, which is a related fungus, also charismatic. It produces this white mycelia on the outside of the beetles. And this is associated with a lot of different insects, but we know it's associated with these bark beetles and naturally controls the populations of these bark beetles sometimes. So it keeps the populations in check. And um, to see how the Grossmania fungus and the Bavaria fungus interact with each other, we um, set up these Petri dish assays. So I placed the Grossmania on one side of the Petri dish and then the Bavaria on the other side of the Petri dish, and then just observed how they grew. And so how much space each fungus was taking up and then what happened when they would grow towards each other. So would they just grow until touching or maybe one fungus would grow over the other fungus? And then I also looked at indirect competition. So <clears throat> looking at the different, um, so this is looking at the growth rate of the two different fungi and you place one fungus on one side of the Petri dish and the other um, fungus on the other side of the Petri dish. Are their growth rates um, reduced at all when they're exposed to each other and they can share the same headspace. And so what we found was that the Grossmania fungus almost always grew faster than the Bovaria, so then the pathogen, and then it um, maintained its space when they were put into the same Petri dishes directly. And then when they were put into the split Petri dishes for indirect competition, both of the fungi reduced their growth versus a control, but neither one reduced it more than the other one. And so from this, we concluded that the Grossmania abutina likely inhibits one of these bark beetle pathogens. And so if the beetle has this Grossmania on its body, maybe it's um, not allowing the Bovaria to infect the beetle. And then we'll put a um, check mark next to this third hypothesis. And so with all of these, we conclude that the Grossmania um, fungus and then the shrews beetle are mutualists and that they both benefit from this interaction here. Um, moving on to my PhD work on the red turpentine beetle and the emerald ash borer. This is part of a really big collaboration. Uh, we're funded by the National Science Foundation and the NSFC, which is the Chinese equivalent of the National Science Foundation. And we're working with, um, so our lab here in Minnesota, and then Catherine Bush's lab that um, they mentioned in the introduction in New York. And then we're working with two labs in China as well. So one in Beijing and then one a couple hours south of Beijing. And this is important because we're studying one beetle that's native to North America. It doesn't really cause a lot of damage here, but in Asia, it's killing millions of trees. So that's the red turpentine beetle. And then the emerald ash borer is the opposite. So this beetle 
is um, native to China. And then as we all know, it's wiping out a lot of the ash trees throughout the US and Canada currently. And so we're really interested in what role these fungi play in the invasion process. And I think that um, these beetles really wouldn't be able to be successful tree colors unless it was for the fungi. <clears throat> so these fungi, I think, are really doing a lot of the work for the beetles. And just a little bit more about the background of the red turpentine beetle. So again, this beetle, it's native to North America, most of the pine regions. And it's a beetle that we don't really think about a lot here, but in China, it um, was introduced in the 1980s to this Shanxi region, and then has expanded its range since then. And this is a photo in China where you can see a lot of these red trees. And these are all standing dead. Uh, the Chinese red pine that have been killed by the red turpentine beetle. And the beetle attacks the base of the tree. And so you might see this out in the forest here in Minnesota or even in Wisconsin, the, um, you have the resin or like the pitch and um, that the tree produces. And then there'll be a little hole in the center, which is where the beetle has entered the tree. So I find this sometime pretty often in a lot of the pine forests, but you kind of have to be looking at the base of the trees. And Again, they're associated with these ophiostomatoid fungi that leave behind these black or blue staining um, fungus, which is a pretty dark fungus. <clears throat> and it grows along the wood here. And you can find it on a lot of the stumps that have been cut. And so if you see this, this tree has been attacked by bark beetles. And in Minnesota, I'm studying these this beetle and their fungi at three different sites. So the first one is this sand dune site, which is about an hour northwest of Minneapolis. And this is really close to a logged area. And the thinking here is that these beetles aren't super common. They're everywhere, but they're not super common in high numbers here in Minnesota. So we're thinking that maybe these beetles will colonize some of these logs that were left behind and they can't defend themselves like a lot of the standing healthy trees can. So maybe there'll be more beetles in this area. Um, this Boot Lake area is about 30 minutes north of St. Paul. And this is a really nice forest. These are old growth white pines. A lot of these trees are 200 years old um, and they're just gigantic trees. So I'm here in the center of this photo and these trees are just towering over me. And then Cloquet, which is the um, where the University of Minnesota has their research forest. So a couple hours north of the Twin Cities. And I'm looking at these beetles and some red pine stands. And so what I do when I go out to each of these sites is I put these funnel traps. So these are called Lindgren funnel traps and they're black. And they kind of look like a silhouette of a tree. And I have these different pheromones and other chemicals that are attractive for the beetles. And so the beetles will fly into these traps and they'll land at, at the bottom of these cups. And so I go and collect these cups pretty frequently. These beetles are out flying right now. So I'm spending a lot of time driving from site to site to collect the beetles. And I also sample the fungi on the wood of these trees. And so here's some of the pitch tubes that are produced by these red turpentine beetles here. And so we're able to compare the fungi that are found in the trees that the beetles are colonizing, as well as what they're just carrying from tree to tree. And when I collect the beetles, I take them back to the lab and I culture on different media. So three different types of media on these Petri dishes. And the first one is this M plus, and this is pretty good for all fungi. It's a really general media. This SDA is really good for the ophiostomatoids, which we know are really important fungi for these beetles, as well as some of the entomopathogenic fungi. Um, this SDA is able to um, get some of the entomopathogenic fungi as well. Um, and then BSA is good for a lot of the basidiomycetes, which these beetles carry around basidiomycetes as well, and they might play important roles in wood decay. 
And so when I <clears throat> take a Petri dish, I found that the best way to just get a lot of fungi off of these beetles is to roll in a zigzag um, the beetles across the media. And then I can select individual colonies and put them into pure culture. And then we sequence all of those different fungi that we find. And then for the galleries, I place little pieces of the wood into the media and then the fungus will grow out. And again, purify those and sequence all of those fungi. And so here's a little overview of what I'm getting. So this is the results from 60 beetles. I found fungi in 20 different orders, 62 genera, and then 111 different species of fungi. And one important group of these are the basidiomycetes. And so this is 16% of what I've been able to culture from the beetles. And again, these can play really important roles in causing wood decay. <clears throat> and one that I find a lot of is this Cryptoporus vulvatus. And you might find this out in the forest and some of the pine areas. It looks, here's a zoomed in photo, but it kind of looks like it's like a marshmallow growing out of the tree. And this is the veiled polypore. So it has this little covering here and it loses the covering at some point in the year. And that's where all the spores will come out of. And so this grows directly out of the bark beetle galleries. And so if you find this in the forest, it might be another indication that there are bark beetles there. And it's interesting that we can find this um, being carried by the beetles from tree to tree. Um, ascomycetes are 76% of the isolate. So it's most of what I'm able to culture. And again, a really important order here is the Ophiostomatales. But different, uh, one difference between the red turpentine beetle and then the spruce beetle that I talked about earlier is that there's a ton of diversity the red turpentine beetle and the ophiostomatoids that they're carrying around. So the spruce beetle in Colorado, if you were to isolate from any of those beetles, you would pretty much just get that one Grossmania aviatina fungus. However, these red turpentine beetles don't really seem to be associated with one ophiostomatoid in particular. And I think that this is pretty interesting um, in their biology and why that would be the case. <clears throat> and some of these might potentially, we might potentially find new species because they're associated with so many of these different ophiostomatoids. Um, Hypocrales is another important order, and this order has a lot of the entomopathogenic fungi, so the pathogens of these beetles, some Bovaria, Acanthomyces, um, cordyceps, again, this is the photo I used earlier for the Bovaria. Um, this order also includes things like trichoderma, which is a pretty ubiquitous fungus. And there's some potential for biological control maybe of controlling maybe other um, fungi with these trichoderma. It's something that a lot of people have tried in the past in many different systems. And um, this diplodia is something that we find associated with these beetles as well. And this can actually cause disease in pine trees that are stressed usually by drought. And we find these, I find this diplodia only at the Southern sites in Minnesota. So not up at Cloquet. And then we have a lot of yeasts that are associated with these beetles. And the yeast can also play really important ecological roles and maybe being able to degrade the tree defenses as well. So similar to some of the ophiostomatoids. And so moving on to the emerald ash borer, fungi. <clears throat> this is a bit of a different type of beetle. This is a wood boring beetle. And um, they have, of course, caused a lot of damage on the ash trees. It's really threatening an entire genus of trees here in North America. And here are some of the adults coming out of the trees. And here's the range here in green of ash trees. And the red turpentine beetle is shown in red. So it was introduced into the Detroit, Michigan area in about 2002 and has been expanding its range throughout um, the US as well as Canada since then. 
And it's interesting to study these beetles here in Minnesota because this is kind of the end of its range here. So I'm able to sample some trees that are pretty healthy still, as well as some trees that have died in the past five or 10 years. And I'm looking at EAB in six different sites here in Minnesota, and these range between by the um, tree species as well as the level of dieback. So the central park here in um, Duluth has a lot of EAB, um, some of the most in the state, which is interesting. Um, and Jay Cook State Park doesn't have as much EAB. It's just a moderate level of dieback. Uh, this other, um, this is another park in Duluth this um, Hartley Park, and it's a moderate level of dieback, but it's black ash instead of green ash. And then Cloquet um, doesn't have much damage or really any damage from the EAB so far. It's another black ash stand. And then Afton State Park, just east of the Twin Cities, is a low, and I've low level of dieback. I've just started to see a few trees that have been killed by EAB and it's green ash, and then Whitewater State Park is another site that I'm looking at, which has a moderate level of dieback, and it's green and black ash. So <clears throat> I sample from all the different points in the life cycle of these EAB. So a few weeks ago, we had the leaves emerge, and soon, in the next few weeks, the adult EAB will be out, and it will start feeding on these leaves. And then they'll lay their eggs on the outsides of the trees. And then the larvae will develop and they'll go inside the trees and create these S-shaped galleries. And then, so I sample from the leaves, the adults, the larvae and the galleries. And when I sample from the galleries, I sample from inside where the larvae have been as well as just outside the gallery to serve as control. And then the larvae leave behind this frass. And so we're interested to see if the fungi in all of these different parts of the life cycle differ. And I've cultured from some of the galleries. I'm still working on a lot of this culturing work from last year, but I have some results from about 85 of the fungi that we've collected and a lot of diversity in these fungi. So 16 orders, 32 genera, and then 44 different species I found so far. And a lot of basidiomycetes again, and a lot of these can play really important roles in causing wood decay. So we find some polyporales. And also some of these are basidiomycete yeasts. Um, and then ascomycetes are the rest of the fungi that I've gotten. So I've only gotten fungi in two different phyla so far. One interesting one here is this diplodia. So again, this um, can cause disease in some of these ash trees. And I'm not sure if Nick's on this call, but another student in our lab studied a lot of these different canker causing fungi associated with the EAB. And what he found was that this diplodia, which is shown here as the B one, caused really big cankers on the ash trees. And so what we think is that in addition to creating those galleries that will cut off the nutrient flow for the trees, um, these beetles might also be carrying some diplodia and other canker causing fungi with them that also will kill the trees and cut off nutrient and water flow. So it's not really, we think it's not really just the beetles, but maybe the fungi are also aiding and killing these trees. Um, Hypocrales is another important order again, and I'm finding some of this cordyceps, which is, I think, a charismatic fungus. This is a moth um, that this cordyceps has infected. And so, um, again, some trichoderma with these EAB. And that's all I have for you all. So thank you all for letting me speak, and I can answer any questions. There was one question that keeps well, that popped up in the chat at least once, and then actually in our living room as well. The term charismatic in reference to fungi, what do you mean by it? Oh, um, just that they look pretty and oh, oh. that they look cool. Okay, okay, yeah. gotcha. There, 
There's another question. How how large are these beetles? The the three beetles that you yeah they're all pretty you know they're all relatively small. Um, I think the best way to describe them is that they're about the size of a grain of rice. So it takes hundreds or even thousands of these beetles to kill a tree, and they will go into underneath the bark of the trees and create their galleries and that will cut off the water and nutrient flow for the tree. Mm -hmm. Is are the is the spruce beetle different than the spruce budworm? Yeah. We um, had a question that too. Yeah. The, I don't know a lot about the spruce budworm, but there you yeah, go. Species. Mm -hmm. How long is your study going to continue? I've got about two and a half more years. So I'm just, I'm just getting going yeah. wow. did about a year ago. Okay. Okay. Uh, the, uh, you know, it's interesting. You're saying that the emerald ash more may be spreading uh, canker fungus that may either kill a tree or contribute to the death of a tree. Uh, as far as the emerald ash borer. I wonder if we'll see any evidence of that as more and more trees become treated uh, with pesticide or insecticide, you know, systemic insecticide to protect the tree from the larvae. Yeah, and I'm, I mean, I'm just getting going with this, but it would be interesting to yeah. see exactly what part of the life cycle these canker-causing fungi might be associated with and where sure. they might be getting introduced into the trees. Mm -hmm. Well, I would assume that they're, I would think they must be coming from the beetle itself when it's laying the eggs, or maybe not. I, I don't know. It's, uh, I'm, I mean, we'll see. I don't, yeah, that's what <laughs> I would think, but I, yeah, I don't want to say I gotcha. I gotcha. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, just a comment is we noticed on a recent foray at, at Frontenac this past weekend, um, many of the ash trees are gigantically stressed. And you could see that the bark is being like either shredded or peeled off by woodpeckers or something. Mm -hmm. um, because half of the, well, well over half of the trees that we're walking to thinking that oh, you know, here's going to be a morale tree. They're ash trees that are actually very, very close to being dead. Um, and, you know, so Frontenac's got a ton of it. There's no... Yeah. And uh, they did cut down a large number of the, of the larger ones. And many of these are the smaller ones that are in some of the ravines and fingers, but it was pretty striking and uh, kind of, you know, scary and not cool mm -hmm. yeah so those a lot of the larger holes are caused by the woodpeckers and they're much better at finding the beetles than we are that's one of the early indicators of eab is the woodpecker holes it looks like there's a question about biological control of the beetles um so some people use parasitoids, so other insects that might lay their eggs in these beetles. Um, that's, they release a lot of the parasitoids here and elsewhere. And I think that there's some success with that. Um, someone else in our lab is studying fungi as a biological control of these beetles. And she's had some success with these in the lab and she's just finishing up her PhD, but she's um, trying a few different ways of controlling the beetles and they have varying amounts of um, effectiveness, but it's some of the same entomopathogenic fungi that I was talking about. So like the Bovaria and the Canthomyces. Somebody asked, uh, when did the turpentine beetle arrive in China? It arrived in the 1980s, we think, but yeah, it really started. Oh, go on. Are they having any success controlling them, or not that I know of? I'm not. Um, I'm not sure what effective control of these beetles would be. So they started causing a lot of damage 
in the past 20 years. So I don't know if it might, it might have been like they needed to build up their populations or um, something else happened where the trees were stressed. But I don't know of any effective control of these beetles in China. I was going to say, it's going to be interesting to kind of follow you, Andrew, and find out in two mm -hmm. years um, what your final results are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, oh, very interesting. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Very interesting. Uh, hope people enjoyed it. It was a great presentation. Uh, so thanks again for, for your input. So thank you. And stuff like that. Look forward to hearing more about it as, uh, as time goes on. Yeah, definitely. Um, so um, as far as uh, additional, uh, I'd like to open, uh, uh, open this, you know, give people an opportunity here uh, to ask any questions about the current uh, mushroom season, share any information about anything that they found that uh, is interesting um, or they have questions about. And we'll try to try to put our heads together and see if we can uh, uh, answer any questions or, or I, I have a, a contribution uh that that uh, i will that's that's one to marvel at i have a very reliable uh uh mushroom hunter who claims to have found two uh lobster mushrooms in northern minnesota Whoa. yeah yeah that's that's how i look too uh uh John, your expression is uh, is kind of, and they said they could not believe it. They had no good explanation, uh, but they found one, and they were just like scratching their head, and then they found another. Well, I, you know, I did want to comment on on one of the finds that we had in Frontenac because Ron just helped me, you know, with the identification of it. Um, it was a white. Uh, white spore deposit just a gilled mushroom with the current gills and um he he nailed it down to uh the train wrecker uh which is actually the new name for it is neolantinus um and i forget the uh, species name but um it's uh, typically it's found later in the season so that's very odd as well um and I think there's a couple of other things that we we are seeing. We we found an enormous. Uh, well, it used to be called Pictoporus Pictoporus cinnabarinus. Uh, it's actually got a different name now too. Uh, but you know, a cinnabar polypore, um, and it was really quite large. I mean, it was probably about five inches wide and three inches, or five inches long, three inches wide. Uh, one of the larger ones we've ever seen, and typically we see things like that a little later in the year as well you know so there's um it, it's it's kind of interesting um and yeah we've had a weird year there's no doubt um if it wouldn't have been for the hot stretch i think maybe um everything would still be waiting and now we have a little bit of colder colder stretch so every year is different so um you know, it's exciting to have a chance to look. Um, by all means, you know, I underscore what Howard said about taking pictures of things because you, know, you can always share those and uh, go back later on and, and check your dates on certain things and, and just be totally amazed that you're finding certain things. But finding lobster mushrooms this early up, up in northern Minnesota would be just really, really bizarre. But... It, I know uh, they're having a foray was. coming up. Uh, they had one actually this weekend, so their first morel foray. So I didn't hear what any of the all bunion, uh, what any of the results, on. but. So. Gene, are you still on? I don't know if Gene was still on and if he's heard anything or not. I think he might have gotten off. So 
I, I had heard from uh, uh, Paula that they had not really found anything. Well, our species count, just for people would know, um, about 25 species at uh, Cicada and then 25 at approximately 25 or so at uh, Frontenac. And they weren't, they weren't all the same kind of things. I mean, there was, there was definitely some diversity um, across the week. And then also, uh, um, you know, just types of things. I mean, most of what we fought, fought at Cicada, a lot of it was polypore. Um, and that was somewhat true at Frontenac, but then, you know, some more gilled mushrooms, especially some things growing on the ground that, um, you know, were kind of, kind of strange. So, um, but there's mushrooms out there to be seen. So it's, the rains have been good. Um, again, you know, it's hard to tell what Willow River will bring. Um, I would definitely encourage anybody that's got some time on, on the holiday to get out to, you know, some of the parks that are close to their area. And even if you can't pick legally in those parks, by all means, take pictures um, and document some of the things that you see. Um, let's see, somebody did ask, do you publish the species list for the forays? We're going to do that. We're going to find um, which, um, which is the best or easiest method for doing that. But I think it'll probably be on a Google Drive um, kind of thing, but um, there will be some way of doing that. We may even, I mean, perhaps, you know, it'll end up being something in the newsletter or something. But we do need to do that. You know, if we're gathering the information, we might as well at least, uh, you know, we're primarily gathering the information to return or to uh, report that back to the DNR uh, for the various parks that we're visiting. But um, it's also very useful information. And I know there's a great deal of curiosity at our forays, you know, of how many and, you know, well, what did this one end up being and that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, so we do need to do that. Yeah, so good question. And, and we, will, we will get the correct mechanisms that, that it's, it shouldn't be secret. It's not secret. It's something we can share without a doubt, so. Anybody um, else? Uh, oh, go I was going to say, I'm going to put a plug in to um, folks. If you haven't um, listened to Dr. Uh, Peter Kennedy's 21 Most Wanted Mushrooms talk, uh, it's on our YouTube channel. Um, go back and, and view that because if you're out and about and um, make, you know, you can download that list, and if you see any of those mushrooms, get some good pictures and um, use iNaturalist if you can, and um, you know, have your book along and do some ID. Yeah, I, I had a question. Um, I'm up here in Duluth, you know, sort of. <laughs> I'm I go out on my own um, up near Brimson, you know, like 50 miles north of here, so. The weekend before last, I found some really fresh young morels in one one tiny spot. Uh, and then uh, a few days ago, I went back and I found like three more, but they looked like they came up at the same time. Do you think I'll get lucky and uh, have another <laughs> fruiting up there or something? I mean, this this hasn't been a very good year for me, which surprises me because it was so wet. I thought I thought I'd get lucky. What do you think? Well, things have been very, very late, and I just, I just recently, like I said, uh, 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 know somebody who, who just had they were they are, were up in the Cook area, and uh, they really overhauled the the black morels in the woods, and I've been seeing you know some other people have done well and some uh, young clear cuts. Uh, as well so can, can you am i able to share can you see what that is yep 
Yeah, sure. yeah. That was that was one of the young ones that I found, and this this is the yeah. area where I find it, just right on the side of the road to Brisbane. Sure. I also found this. What anybody recognize what those are? Sorry, I didn't get anything more than that. No, but several of these little young ones. Yeah. No. I would consider going to look more in uh, in the in the actual woods themselves. Yeah. Uh, at this point for, for the black morels. Okay. And, uh, you know, uh, because that's, you know, as the season progresses in that, in that old, those open areas are going to warm up first and, you know, further in the woods, uh, maybe going in the woods, right where you found those in those woods might be, uh, uh might be a good spot. Yeah, I, I did that, but no luck so far. Yeah, yeah. Generally, you know, they say that uh, for those for the type those type of morels, you're really uh, uh, looking for the areas where the popple stands are starting to self thin themselves. They usually are getting to be about the size of your wrist or or so, and and there's going to be a lot of you know some of them are dying and falling over and stuff. Is we find a lot of the black morels are are you know are decomposers or saprophytic, and I found them growing right out of logs, literally. So that's been my experience. I'm not an expert of black morels by any means, but I can share that. Maybe somebody else has better or more information. I'm going to answer. I'm going to answer just a, a quick. Um, there's a question in general. Are there any forays planned in central Minnesota? Um, we still have not um, come up with a list for uh, what we're going to do for the summer and fall. Um, typically, I mean, I'm not sure exactly how far you mean for central Minnesota, but um, um, usually we tend to be, you know, pretty metro area centric. But um, he mentioned actually in the presentation he mentioned sand dunes that's one of the ones we've gone to in the past which is a little further up but still not over central um I you know we are gonna more. we're gonna be doing a presentation at uh up at tamarack wildlife refuge uh, in august and there will be kind of some foray with that st cloud to brainerd stretch i understand that now we we haven't planned any yet, but if somebody is, if somebody wants to lead one, there's we have nothing against it by any means, um, you know. So there's a four A planning process we go through, and you know, it's just you have to have people, you know, willing to lead them. So you know, if you yeah. want to lead one, well, or if there's somebody if, cognizant by all means. Well, and and I would suggest if if you have a good what you would consider a good location uh you know uh that you'd be interested in exploring we we'd sure see if we can put one together uh somebody just mentioned the the you know checking with the paul bunyan club but they're i i'm aware of their forays this year and they are a, a fair bit north of brainerd uh area so so they're they're, they're closer Typically closer to Bemidji. I, I think Hackensack, is, Hackensack was one of the closest ones I saw. Yeah, that'd be the first one south that I know of. Yeah. Hackensack areas. But. Yeah. So. But they do have, you know, I mean, um, you know, if you want to, that information, you know, can be shared as well, too. So. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, anybody wants to email me, I can try to get that to you or Peter because he's got the list as yep. well. Yep. Yep. Just, uh, you know, if people have suggestions, uh, you know, first, you know, as far as uh, as far as, you know, for a you know, process, what we what we really need as a, a location. Uh, I also want to uh, mention and thank everybody that uh, that. Uh, um, what you got in your yard? 
we just had that a we just had a deer walk through our yard. I mean, we're oh, okay. we're like right in the, in the middle, middle of Burnsville. Burnsville. It's like yeah. okay, so. But anyway, I want to thank yeah. everybody that uh, took the time to participate in uh, the the for a survey uh, that we did. We're still kind of you know compiling the results and uh, in the process of getting back to some people with who had some information, but. Uh, one thing the 4A committee is uh, very much open to and interested in is if people have ideas for locations and stuff that, you know, we can put together, then that can be uh, the start of a process to create a 4A. Um, you know, we've got a list of, of places that we're, that we're kind of planning right now, but uh, it's, uh, it's definitely... Uh, uh, we kind of the more forays, uh, kind of the better, as long as we can staff them. So uh, we're looking for people to uh, make suggestions to us. Yeah, I was just going to mention, and I, I just emailed I, I mean i just chatted back to to charles about this is we have done some naturalist programs at uh, sibley state park which is really close to the area he's talking about specifically um in the past because we had an association with their naturalist or with their dnr staff person but i'm we've sort of lost track of her right now so she had a baby and a bunch of other things and then we had COVID and other stuff so um it's definitely uh, not out of the not out of the realm of possibility. I've I've uh, I've I find uh, uh, I find that uh, uh, Lindbergh State Park in Little Falls uh, is has lots of mushrooms in it, and very very interesting place to to look. I've hunted there myself, and uh, while that is a little far. Uh, you know, from the Twin Cities, it's not totally beyond, uh, you know, beyond a distance. And so, you know, it, it's just a matter of uh, people, uh, you know, showing interest and wanting to do, do that. That's what we need is input. Yep. We're, we're always looking to add. Yeah, we're always yeah, looking to look add for us. Yeah, yeah, lots of, lots of chanterelles. And there can be lots of uh, lot if you get it if the timing is right. There can be a lot of porcini's at Lindbergh as well. But lots of chanterelles for sure. Well, if. Uh, People don't really have anything to add. Uh, I guess we can uh, adjourn this meeting. It was kind of a short one, but uh, uh, nothing necessarily wrong with that. And really appreciate everybody joining. Is there anything else, John, that you can think of that we should talk about? Just next month, uh, we will have two more um, of the grad scholarship presentations. Yep. Um, Pardon me? Doris, don't you for, uh, for, I mean, you know, and again, it was the Doris Johans and James Swanson Memorial Scholarship. So my wife wanted me to make sure to just okay. re remind everybody that that's, yeah. um, that they were actually named after uh, a couple of our long, long standing members. And, uh, um, so there will be two more, uh, Jesse Carlson and Charles Ayers will be doing uh, presentations that will be equally as interesting um, as the one tonight. I mean, Andrew, that was, that was phenomenal. I mean, we see the stupid beetles and the, re the results. And we had the foray actually out in Colorado, the Nama foray this past summer. And it, it's sad looking. And, and I mean, they're fighting fires and all that stuff. And you got all these dead trees standing. I mean, uh, how I bad experienced the same thing in, in Utah. I was up on uh, 
uh, there, there's, there's a place called Mirror Lake in Utah where that's up near the, the summit and you go over the pass and on one side you have the ski areas and stuff and, and you see some, some trees, but you go up over the pass and you look down and it's just devastation. I mean, there's not, there's not a mature in, in sections of the forest, there's not a mature tree that's not dead and you see young ones but not big ones they're all dead it's just gray like like one of those pictures you showed that was maybe not quite that bad but pretty dramatic yeah, one of our also, lectures, oh yeah, yeah go ahead good. yeah one of the lectures that uh, the nama foray said it's been 10 years of record drought record heat thus beetles uh, have an advantage on any living tree and all three of those combined is tinderbox forest fires just raging unstoppable uh, so it's a really sad story we drove up to Yellowstone from from Denver uh, through the mountains and it was mile after mile of, of black or dead trees Kathy did want us to put in a quick plug that uh, registration for the annual NAMA foray uh, for Potosi, uh, Missouri is open. Uh, there's still some space open that runs from September 29th through October 2nd. Um, should be a phenomenal uh, area to check. Similar in some ways to us, but there'll be some unique things found there that we don't find here. And, uh, you know, Stu gives us time for um, our September and October forays as well. So um, you, you would want to check out the NAMICO website because you would have to be an, an, a North American Mycological Association member um, to attend it. But uh, again, it's, it's extremely, extremely interesting. You get to see a different area. Um, this is that's in the that's in the uh, St. Louis vicinity of Missouri. So easy drive, ten hours. I did it a whole bunch. My son went to SLU, so St. Louis U. So very good. And I hear that the uh, the location is also the center for uh, Epicurean delight. It's a uh, uh, a cook's paradise. So at, at the location we're staying. So that should be doubly interesting. That sounds great. Hope they're good mushroom cooks. <laughs> Any other comments or? Great. Thanks for everybody coming. See really you appreciate on it. And June 13th, we'll one. see ya. Yep. All right. Very good. good Take call. care. Bye. Bye.